So welcome to UCSF Family and Community Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, we have a wonderful session uh, in store for everyone today, but before we start, just a few of the regular housekeeping announcements. I want to remind everyone that this session is being recorded. Um, and if you'd like to review today's session or see prior Grand Round sessions that you've missed, you can check us out on the um, uh, UCSF Family and Community Medicine Grand Rounds website um, uh, to see any prior sessions or today's. Um, uh, our session today is hopefully going to be an interactive one. Uh, we uh, have a Q&A function so that you can add comments or um, or questions for uh, for Dr. Fine to uh, to really engage in a uh, reflective and hopefully um, uh, exciting discussion uh, with our speaker. So to please use the Q and A session. We'd also love to hear your suggestions for um, about today's session, any feedback that you have, or um, uh, suggestions for future grand rounds. And so um, there'll be a link in the chat to fill out if there's something that's something that you're interested in. And last but not least, before we start, as always, I want to say thank you to our wonderful tech team. Today we have um, Roy Johnston, Erica Mitchell, and Brian Co. All helping us out with the tech team. So an advance thanks to them. And most of all, a special welcome and thank you to our speaker, Dr. Michael Fine. Uh, the name of today's session is What is Medicine For? Reflections from On Medicine as Colonialism, sorry, which is uh, Dr. Fine's new book title. Um, and uh, the session today will really ask us to dive deeply into what is medicine for? Um, Dr. Fine's book on medicine as colonialism uses a point of departure to discuss evidence-based ways in which medicine and healthcare can be effective in improving population health as we strengthen and bring resilience to our communities. Dr. Fine encourages us to keep our eyes on the prizes of population health and community resilience and to listen to patients and communities so that physicians in training and those of us who are not in training anymore but are still learning aren't overwhelmed by the demands of healthcare bureaucrats and others who are profiting from healthcare. Uh, Dr. Michael Fine is an award-winning author, a community organizer, a public health uh, expert and leader, and most importantly, a family physician um, and a fiction writer. Uh, he's the author of On Medicine is Colonialism, uh, which uh, we will be discussing today. Um, uh, and it really dives into uh, the ways in which medicine and healthcare have been used by healthcare profiteers to co-opt the state's regulatory power, Medicare and Medicaid, and extract resources from communities to upend democracy in the US. Um, in addition, I just had to add this in, Dr. Uh, Fine is a fiction writer, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and he, uh, his, uh, his uh, publication, the, the Bull and Other Stories, um, has won the Literary Fiction Book of the Year from the IPNE. Um, and last but not least, Dr. Fine serves as the Chief Health Strategist for the City of Central Falls, Rhode Island. Um, he is truly a family doctor in the breadth of his interests, and I'm very excited to welcome him today. So thank you, Dr. Fine, for joining thank, us. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be with you today. Um, I'm speaking to you from Situate, Rhode Island, a little community of 10,000, uh, which is about 15 miles from Providence. Um, and I'm going to be speaking a lot about Central Falls, Rhode Island, which is Rhode Island's smallest, most densely populated, uh, most uh, diverse um, and poorest community. Um, it's the community in which I serve as uh, the chief health strategist. Um, I went uh, Brian, I'm having a little trouble getting the slides myself. They seem to disappear. Yeah. Can you reshare that? Okay. Just go to that green button and share screen for us. Yep. Sorry about that. There we go. Can you guys see that? Looks good here. Thanks. Okay. Good. Sorry for that. Uh, bump. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, and... I'm going to be talking to you as a primary care militant. I went into the pandemic um, having spent years and years working on uh, population-based primary care. Um, I'm talking to you actually from uh, the basement of my house, which is uh, where I practiced for many years um, and where I got to do some initial research on the per person per year cost of primary care. Uh, we published something about this in 1996. We found it was $106 um, per person per year 
um, basically less than the cost of other uh, population-based services that communities provide for themselves. And that made me think the way to approach healthcare reform or a way to approach healthcare reform um, might be to provide primary care to all Americans. Um, and Brian, I'm afraid I am having trouble advancing the slot. Um, you click on, let's see, maybe uh, use your arrow key on your uh, keyboard. That's what I'm using. Let's try this one. Oh. I'm more than happy to share for you. Go ahead. If you want to do that, yeah. can you advance them? Yeah, what I can do, uh, I'll share from my screen and you just tell me when to advance. Does that work? Works fine for me. Got it. Yep. Sorry for this delay, everybody. While we're waiting, um, as I said, Situate is a community of 10,000, and it's a uh, very nice uh, place to use from a health policy perspective because that round number uh, lets us think clearly about denominators in the same way uh, Rhode Island is a tiny little state with a population of a million, um, also a nice denominator uh, that helps us think about policy in a mo more coherent way. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, I have no disclosures. Next slide. Um, these are the goals and objectives we're going to talk about uh, public health improvements and uh, associated with primary care practice and why medicine um, really matters. Next slide, please. Um, the, the talk is in memory of Jack Geiger, who I'm sure many of you know about. I had the honor of knowing Jack for many years. Um, uh, he was the founder of the Community Health Center Movement in the United States, uh, which, uh, as most of us know, 1,400 uh, community health centers in the United States at 14,000 sites, uh, providing the best measured primary care to 30 million Americans, almost one-tenth of the country. In Rhode Island, community health centers provide primary care to 15% of the population. Um, Jack's work is important for many reasons, uh, but one of the reasons that's most important in the context of this talk is the way in which Jack figured out how to use government uh, to advance uh, both primary care um, and to use primary care itself uh, to begin to work on health disparities. Next slide, please. Um, I want to start with three key facts which I brought into the pandemic and which I've been obsessing about for a number of years. The first, as I think everybody knows, is that the United States spends an ungodly amount of money on health care. $4.3 trillion in 2021. That's about 20% of the gross domestic product. That's $12,900 per person, which has been increasing at an average of 4.9% a year, almost twice the, the rate, the average rate of inflation over many years in normal times. Um, when you break that down and think about a denominator, that's $129 million for every community of 10,000 people. One of the nice things about living in this little town of Situate with a population of 10,000 was when you run those numbers out, uh, it turns out uh, that Situate itself, for its entire set of municipal services, schools and roads and fire and police, spends about $40 million a year. So in the United States, we are spending three times what we're spending on municipal services for healthcare. Um, even though there's not very good evidence um, that healthcare matters much for population health outcomes, probably contributes only about 10% uh, to public health outcomes, though the data on which that's based um, is a bit sketchy. Anyway, next, next slide, please. Um, healthcare spending matters because uh, of this, this slide shows what's happened um, to, to funding for public housing over the last 40 years while healthcare expenditures were ballooning. Um, spending on housing went through the floor, spending on education, spending on public transportation, uh, spending on community development, um, all of these critical services, which are the things that matter for public health outcomes, um, they went away having been canalized 
ca uh, cannibalized um, by uh, healthcare expenditures themselves. Next slide, please. Um, the other important fact, or another important fact, um, is that we in the United States, not we, but uh, people with something to sell, um, spend close to $720 million a year on lobbying, um, which is how they co-opt government to get done what they want to be done to make sure that this level of spending continues the way it is. Next slide, please. Um, and the third critical fact that I've been walking around with and was when we went into the pandemic um, is that no more than 43% of the United States population now has a meaningful primary care relationship. That number has been slipping for years and years and years. And we as primary care folks have not spent anywhere near enough attention to it uh, because the public health value of primary care, which is huge, primary care is public health boots on the ground. The public health value really depends on us effectively addressing the entire population, the entire denominator. Um, yet that number has been slipping away. For those of us who have been thinking for a long time about uh, Medicare for all or single payer, um, it's worth noting with some pain um, that even people with Medicare who have the best insurance available in the United States, um, even people with Medicare, the number is down to only 67% of Medicare beneficiaries having had a primary care visit within the last year, 2019. Next, next slide. Um, and the declining use of primary care matters because primary care is the only medical service that's ever been shown to reduce cost while it improves public health outcomes. It is the coin of the realm if you want to improve public health in the United States. Next slide, please. Um, and, and, you know, it matters because medicine um, improves the life chances of individuals. Medicine actually works. Um, we've seen the virtual elimination of polio, measles, rumps, rubella, and the birth defects that rubella caused in the last 75 to 100 years. We've eliminated rabies in the United States, which is a big deal if you've traveled internationally and seen what rabies can do. Um, we've seen the virtual uh, eradication of rheumatic heart disease. Um, in my lifetime, we've seen the disappear, the effective disappearance of flash pulmonary edema, which we used to happen all the time after Thanksgiving and Christmas when people got salt overloads. Um, reduction in smoking uh, has saved 8 million lives and 350 million years of productive life um, since we started working on it in 1964. That's up to 2012, so the number is way greater. Um, the control of hypertension and diabetes has worked to prevent heart disease and stroke. Uh, the potential years of life lost to 75 from ischemic heart disease dropped by 64% in 25 years. The potential, the years of potential life loss to 75 from stroke fell by 47%. We've seen a 70% reduction in adolescent pregnancy. Our, our control of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 was inadequate for sure. We had 900,000 excess deaths. But that wasn't because of what primary care did or failed to do. In fact, in many places, primary care was essentially left out from the vaccination process. But even so, we saved 3 million lives and prevented 18 million infections by working together. Um, and even colon cancer screening, which we are critical in making sure happens, saves about 50,000 lives a year in the United States. Next slide, please. Um, even so, we lost life expectancy from 2014 to 2021, the first time we've seen a drop in life expectancy in 100 years. Now, CDC thinks the reasons for that are COVID-19, um, mostly drug overdose, uh, unintentional injuries, mostly drug overdose deaths, suicide, heart disease, chronic liver disease, and cirrhosis, you know, probably from hepatitis C. Um, but some of us think that the distal causes of that lost life expectancy have to do with income inequality and its consequences and the shrinkage of primary care utilization, because we aren't, there aren't enough of us to address the denominator, and we're not taking care of enough people to have the kind of public health impact we ought to have. Next slide. Um, medicine, in addition, um, is a powerful way to reduce health 
disparities, it's not enough by any means, not even close to enough. Clearly, housing, education, uh, public transportation, uh, uh, community development um, are all things that matter way more than medicine. But even so, not medicine in general, but primary care itself primary care supply is associated with lower causes, lower rates of all-cause heart disease, all-cause heart disease and cancer mortality, infant mortality, um, and low birth weight, even in the presence of income inequality. Um, you know, the study, as this has been studied um, in general, uh, primary care is a pretty effective way to approach health disparities with the exception of uh, primary care being supply being a relatively weak predictor of black mortality um, in low income inequality uh, uh, population areas. Um, and it's it's uh, so primary care is actually, you know, a method we have to address the health disparities that exist. Um, we're just not doing enough of it. I'm remembering that the best way to reduce health disparities um, is to make sure that all Americans have safe and healthy housing, um, make sure that we're improving public education, public transportation, et cetera. Next slide, please. And then medicine actually helps mitigate um, some of the harms done by social dysfunction because it gives us the tools to bear witness um, and to be advocates to talk about health disparities, to talk about unequal treatment, um, to bear witness on, around healthy, unhealthy housing um, and the danger it causes to the people we take care of, the dangers from lead poisoning, from water quality, in terms of asthma prevalence. Um, we have the opportunity to bear witness and talk about the health effects of homelessness and incarceration um, and about substance use disorder and the things that both predict it um, and the things we can use to help to help uh, prevent um, more substance use disorder and more substance use uh, overdose death. Next slide. Um, medicine also attends to the needs of individuals as we are good at being with the people we take care of, thinking about how to relieve pain, mitigate suffering, preserve or restore function, promote the agency of the people we take care of by listening to them and helping them remember that they're important. Um, and also obviously by using the preventive technologies, um, we all know to prevent injury, to prevent the loss of function and premature death, and therefore, and thereby create more equal outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, and we do this by relationship, by building relationships over time. There's a great paper from uh, a great recent paper uh, that shows how continuity um, works across many different domains to uh, improve all sorts of outcomes. There's evidence that um, taking time, that sitting with with patients, um, is associated with better communications, uh, satisf pa better patient satisfaction, better adherence, and better rapport. We provide context, knowing families. Um, and knowing communities and knowing what's important for people um, and how they can uh, access the healthcare that works, um, understanding that not all does. Um, and we provide that focus on the needs of individuals, which is so important in promoting agency and making sure that the people we take care of feel like they have what they need to participate in the democratic process. Next slide, please. Um, so what is medicine for? Medicine's for improving the public's health. It's for reducing and eliminating health disparities. Um, it's for mitigating some of the harms done by social dysfunction, um, by bearing witness and through advocacy. And it's for helping individuals, the people we take care of, um, by removing pain, reducing suffering, uh, preserving and restoring function, promoting agency, um, and preventing illness, injury, loss of function, and premature death. Um, and also for promoting the idea that each person's life has meaning, which is really a necessary condition for society of people living together in peace. And thereby, um, medicine helps strengthen and protect democracy itself. Next slide, please. Now, I'm gonna tell a story. This is Central Falls. This is the first neighborhood health station, the first urban neighborhood health station in the United States in the poorest 
um, most diverse, uh, most densely populated community in Rhode Island, um, a community that when the pandemic hit was for different periods of time, the most infected place in the state, in the nation, and in the world, because it's a place where people live in densely packed houses. Um, and when the pandemic hit and things closed down, uh, people who lived in Central Falls were essentially ordered by our governor to go to work, um, where people work in or work, worked and do work um, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, industrial plants, um, in packing houses, in fish houses, worked together closely, picked up the virus, brought the virus home to their uh, triple deckers where people live four, six, eight, 10, 12 people in a two bedroom apartment sharing a single bathroom and a single uh, kitchen. Uh, the neighborhood health station was designed to take care of the entire population of the city of Central Falls with enough clinicians, mental behavioral health workers, uh, physical therapists, uh, substance use disorder counselors, uh, lab, x-ray, every service that we thought was important um, and it was designed to serve the entire population of the city. When the pandemic hit, however, a strange thing happened. Um, the, the executive leadership decided to close the neighborhood health station to new patients in this community where there were 3,000 to 5,000 undocumented people and where the neighborhood health station was their only access. Um, at a time when the state's policy said, if you get sick, call your primary care doctor. That left half of the city of Central Falls without primary care doctors. Um, why they decided to do that is another story, but I, I, I got to tell you that uh, the C-suite um, had absolutely no diversity. Everybody who worked in the C-suite lives in the suburbs and thinks about the world somewhat differently than I do. Um, at any, in, at any rate, at that moment, the mayor of, of Central Falls and a few others put to, stood up an emergency operations plan. Um, we pulled together 18 community organizations and in the space of just two weeks, designed a call-in service um, that got a clinician on the phone when somebody got sick. Um, it got them tested. It got them uh, isolation counseling. Um, it got them isolation supplies, it got them cash, it got them mental, mental behavioral health counseling over the phone, um, it got them food, um, and so forth. It was an amazing process. And, you know, I can't prove that this is, uh, that, that, the, that the result that I know about uh, was a consequence of that, but it's still the case that Central Falls, the most infected place um, in the state of Rhode Island, had the sixth lowest uh, COVID mortality rate in the state. So it's a great process put together by volunteers in no time, people working together, working together collectively to take care of each other. Um, it ran through the period when uh, the surge began to drop off. At that point, we said, gee whiz, we ought to keep this going. We ought to do uh, focused hotspot testing, find the residual disease, um, and prevent or push back the time when we'd get the recurrence in the fall that we all uh, expected. So we uh, said, we sort of worked worked our pencils a little bit, figured out that uh, it was going to cost about $800,000 to do that for a year. Uh, we called up the state and said, why don't you send us the money to do this? Um, because we think we've got this now. We've got a whole collaboration that's you know standing up um, that's running, that works perfectly well. And you, state government, you just got a billion dollars, so $800,000 isn't that much. The moment we started talking about money, everything changed. All of a sudden, on all our Zooms, there appeared four to six or eight new people. Um, many of them were, or all of them, were from out of the state. Um, were from Minnesota and Iowa and all sorts of places who didn't understand um, anything about uh, the Hispanic culture that, uh, or the Cape Verdean culture um, that was so important in Central Falls itself. Um, so there were three months of back and forth dis discussion. At the end of three months, uh, the state decided to give not $800,000 to the cities, um, but $175,000 to a contractor. 
Um, and in fact, um, all the folks on the phone were contractors. They were all highly paid. Um, and we learned later that the state paid $12.4 million to contractors during the period when we were asking for you know, funding to do what this community had been doing and wanted to do. And at that moment, a light went off in my brain. The light in my brain says, this is funny. It almost seems like, you know, this is folks who are coming here to extract money from this community under the umbrella of the pandemic. It feels like stuff I've read about colonialism. Next slide, slide please. Next, uh, um, you know, I mean, it seemed like all these consultants were there um, to pry loose some of the $13,000 per person per year that is spent in the United States on health services. Next slide, please. So what is colonialism? You know, I mean, I had to work through that because I, I was so surprised by this. Colonialism is a process by which well, we all remember this. One nation conquers another nation or territory, you know, using its its gunboats and its arms, um, and uses its military not might to extract the resources of the conquered place. Um, it's an activity of nation states and results in the conquered place losing its agency, its ability to fend for itself, to defend itself, loses its self governance, um, and any hope of a democratic society as it's losing its resources. Next slide, please. What could colonialism possibly have to do with medicine or medicine as a profession? Next slide, please. Um, and then I began to think, what if colonialism has changed? What if it's become a process by which the state was being used by people seeking profit um, and the object of their attention had become that $13,000 per person per year, which in a certain way can be considered resources of our neighborhoods and communities. And finally, what if medicine itself, instead of gunboats, was now the tool that these folks were being used to extract resources? Next slide, please. So I followed the money. Um, and this is what I found. Next slide, please. Turns out the first thing I found was kind of shocking to me and is kind of a, an incidental finding. Um, the first thing I, I discovered that we were actually training just a fraction of the physician and primary care workforce we need. Um, you know, we've all known that lots of people are foreign trained, but it turns out 25% of all US residents and physicians are in fact foreign trained. That was kind of a big deal for me because it was a model for um, how colonialism works around the world. And we had the sense that maybe we were extracting the workforce resources from other countries, um, but it hadn't occurred to me that fully 25% of us were foreign trained. And that might mean that we are training 25% fewer um, fewer physicians than we need to train, fewer physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs. Um, now, and then I started to think, because I, I, I got involved with the beginning of the direct primary care movement, um, it suddenly occurred to me that, you know, most of us have panel sizes of 1,500 to 3,000 or something like that. What we've learned from direct primary care is that the uh, the, the most appropriate panel size for all of us is probably four to 600. Um, us trying to do panels of 1,500 to 3,000 is probably why we're all tired because we're doing the work of three or four people. It has never, it had never occurred to me that technology had changed and it just wasn't possible to do these big, big panels anymore. Um, you know, when you talk about direct primary care to people, people often say, well, gee whiz, you know, if everybody had panel sizes of 400 to 600, then we won't have enough doctors. Nobody ever says, holy moly, that means we're just not training enough people. And we ought to like quadruple the number of people we're training because when you run these numbers out, it turns out we're probably short 200,000 primary care physicians. Um, and all of us, you know, are sort of taking the brunt of that um, though it wasn't clear when I first thought about this, it wasn't clear why that might have happened, why we hadn't expanded training to meet the need. Next slide, please. Um, 
So I started to, to comb down and look at different segments of the healthcare economy. First, um, I looked at, at the impact of insurance companies, the economic impact of insurance companies on communities. I sort of picked Medicare Advantage as a kind of interesting thing, you know, that's quite controversial. Medicare Advantage has 27 million enrollees. You know, I'll save the history and how the insurance companies used the lobbying process to change the deal. Um, however, there are now in 2019, uh, we were spending about $12,000 per enrollee. You know, when you run those numbers out, understanding the medical loss ratio is 85%. The health insurance take of, of Medicare Advantage is $48 billion, a number that just blew me away. Next slide, please. And when you do the same analysis with managed Medicaid, which exists now in 41 states and provides care to over 53 million people, less cost per person per year, more people, same medical loss ratio. You run those numbers out, um, you're talking about $47 billion. Next slide, please. When you put those two numbers together, that's almost $100 billion. And when you do some quick math and division, it turns out that $100 billion um, will buy you enough uh, an, enough housing um, to wait, wipe out homelessness in the United States um, in less than a year, or will buy you um, enough tuitions for medical school, APRNs or PAs, um, basically to take care of the shortage of, of, uh, of, of primary care folks um, to address the population as a whole. So it almost, you know, it's, it's hard to argue there's a sort of one-to-one -one co correspondence, but it does almost seem like the money we should have been spending on, on public housing or the money we should have been spending on training primary care clinicians is being siphoned off someplace else. Um, and if we had that money, we could actually do the things we need to do to improve the public health of all Americans. Next slide, please. You can do the same thing with commercial insurance, another $124 billion that goes to health insurance companies. Next slide, please. And remember, that every part about Medicare, Medicaid, and even commercial insurance is either federally funded, um, fe federal, federally uh, monitored, or uh, federally regulated. It's all a public process. Now, if we look at pharma, same sort of deal. First of all, you have to remember that pharma is entirely FDA regulated. Um, it's 20% of the total healthcare spend, and it's everywhere. I was shocked to discover that 89% of people over 65 use prescription medicines, and about 50% of Americans use at least one prescription in the last 30 days. Everybody's using these wonderful medicines. Next slide, please. At a tremendous cost. Um, in the United States, we spend $378 billion a year on pharmaceuticals. It's about 20% of the total healthcare spend. Um, if you break that down to communities like the size of, of Situate, um, that means we spend about $12.5 million a year for people in Situate on pharmaceuticals. Now, it happens that I know that Situate sp spends $22 million on schools, or about twice that amount. In Situate, when we spend $22 million on schools, we get 138 employees who live in Situate and have the money from that uh, spending recircle um, with something called the multiplier effect, making the community itself more resilient. Um, if we look at the same, you know, if we sort of divide that in half and say, well, what would it be if it was 12 million? We'd probably have 70 million employees. If you compare that with our one Walgreens drugstore, there are eight employees in Situate who are, pharma who are pharmacy related. So for our public spend or, or semi-public <laughs> spend of $11 million, we are getting nowhere near the economic resilience or community development that we get from, from spending on school. Schools, all the money from pharmaceuticals get extracted out of the community and get sent to research and development, which is someplace else, to claims processing, which is someplace else, uh, to uh, profit, which is definitely someplace else. Um, it is a scary kind of thing to see it is wealth extraction supervised by, essentially supervised by the FDA, um, 
you know, so that our spending actually gets used against us. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at hospitals, again, same sort of thing. Turns out most hospital workers who live locally earn less than $50,000 a year um, with about 12.5% uh, um, earning more than $100,000 a year. Um, and when you talk to health policy folks about this, they say, well, you know, it's kind of no big deal because, you know, one CEO who cares, um, you know, like most of people, most of the hospital employees, you know, are, are the money is better distributed. Well, it turns out two things. First of all, you know, over 80 two of the largest nonprofit hospitals in the United States in 2017, of 82, only six paid their CEOs less than a million. 13 paid their CEOs between five and $21.6 million, um, with the bulk paying their CEOs between one and $5 million. And it turns out that 22% of hospital employee income or $80 billion a year is paid to hospital workers who are making more than $100,000 a year. And I bet very few of them live in the communities the hospital served. Understanding that 30 to 40% of all healthcare expenditures are for hospital care, that there's no evidence that the number and location of hospital beds is associated with any measurable public health outcome, remembering that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. You can't make a conclusion that there is no value. We just don't know what the value is and how many we need. And finally, that at least 61% of all hospital income has a public funding source. We are paying public money to run hospitals. We have no effective public oversight or public involvement in hospital choices, governance, um, or uh, or the population that hospitals serve. Um, next slide, please. Um, you, you can do the same thing looking at the impact of physicians on communities. Um, you know, this is basically, you know, a problem of specialty physicians where um, the concentration of specialty physicians is two to five times greater in uh, small, medium, and large metropolitan communities than it is in rural than it is in rural counties. Um, we concentrate specialty care um, in those places. I can't tell you that I have evidence that uh, in the more urban areas, they are either evenly distributed or uh, are maldistributed between low income and high income areas. But I think we all know that most specialists are gonna show up in high income areas. Again, essentially extracting wealth um, from places that are rural or live in poverty and moving that wealth to places um, where people have been doing pretty well already. Remembering that all residency training, every single bit is publicly funded by CMS so that the specialty distribution is theoretically under direct federal control if we wanted the federal government to exert that control. We just haven't made that choice. Next slide, please. Um, you know, even primary care, which to me is the holy grail, you know, if you look at what's happening economically with CVS buying Oak Street for $10.6 billion and Amazon buying One Medical for $3.9 billion, et cetera, et cetera, somebody is using primary care as a Trojan horse to pull money out of the system, out of the public domain and put it into private profit. Next, next slide, please. I mean, it turns out as well that all half of, of spending, fully half of spend, spending on healthcare in the United States is public funds. When anybody starts to talk about socialism or not socialism and all that kind of stuff, what everybody seems to be forgetting is that, you know, what's being spent is public money. That public money is being diver diverted from the public po pocketbook used for the public good into private pockets um, for private uh, uh, profit. Um, next slide, please. And not only um, are we spending public money, but the entire thing, every single bit of healthcare is regulated, uh, uh, is regulated as part of a public process. Um, I didn't mention that I spent four years as the director of the Rhode Island uh, Department of Health. I was this regulator. 
Um, and I began to understand that all I got to do was to try my best to make sure that hospitals didn't cut the wrong leg off. I didn't by any means have a way of uh, using regulation um, to change what people did um, to get uh, us to be able to improve public health outcomes or reduce total cost. And I also saw how the regulatory process is used by stakeholders over and over and over again to limit competition, to market their products by you know, sort of taking stuff to legislators and, and to set prices. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we learn by following the money? We learn that much of the economic activity around healthcare leads to a net transfer of wealth from neighborhoods and communities into the pockets of corporations and their shareholders. And it's across every domain, every single domain of healthcare that exists. I did this analysis for each of these domains and it actually made me physically sick. Uh, remembering that administrators and, and the process of administration now consumes 37% of healthcare dollars instead of uh, us spending that money on either primary care, which matters, or on education or public housing, or public transportation, or other public services that might address economic disparities, which then cause health disparities. Next slide, please. Um, and what do we learn furthermore by following the money? That all healthcare is a public process, um, that the transfer of resources um, then in this way compounds the health challenges of communities by siphoning off the resources we need um, to create the public services that matter for public health outcomes. And that this wealth, this wealth transfer at the end of the day reduces the agency of individuals and communities um, because instead of government addressing what people and communities need, um, the money is used by lobbyists $718 million a year to get government to do what people who have something to sell want. Next slide, please. So, you know, profit for investors, you know, siphoning money from communities, that's not what we all signed up for. We have a different set of values. Next slide, please. I, and, and that to me means fairly clearly that our challenge and opportunity um, is really to understand these processes, to understand this money, to understand how it flows, and to do what we need to do to build a healthcare system that's for people, not for profit, and that starts by providing robust primary care to all Americans in every American neighborhood and community. Next slide, please. Um, and and you know that's in a certain way what Jack Geiger taught us. Um, Jack understood that if government can be used uh, to strip away the resources needed to create health equity, then government can be used to take those resources back and create optimal and equal health for all Americans. Next slide, please. Um, my teacher, Bernard Wound, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for starting uh, or co-founding International Physicians to Prevent Nuclear War, um, taught us, um, and he'd say this over and over again, if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. I hope in the last 45 or so minutes, I've showed you what to me previously was invisible. So now together we can do what's been thought to be impossible together. Next slide, please. Remembering um, that while it's upsetting, the approach that I think we need to use is not to mourn, but to organize. Thank you. Next slide, please. Comments, questions, critiques, and so forth. Wow. Michael, I want to thank you so much for an incredibly impactful uh, just beginning to the conversation that I think we will all be having with ourselves as we try to digest the truly you know, staggering, some truly staggering concepts and critiques of our healthcare system. Um, I want to read some of the comments that we have um, for you. Uh, Carolyn Fichtenberg said, uh, 
this is so fascinating to see it this way. And I, I believe Carolyn was commenting on the same slide that really got me, which is actually one of your very first slides about the um, plummeting in um, housing expenditures at the same time that um, healthcare costs had skyrocketed. Um, just a staggering, could have and stopped can, right there with a staggering thought see, right there. And you can see the same thing in education. Um, and in public transportation, I mean, this is a, a pattern that repeats itself in all public policy in the United States for the last 40 years. Yeah, just really, I appreciate, um, I appreciate you calling that out. Um, I also want to add um, uh, a comment from uh, Rachel Logan. And by the way, if folks have other thoughts or comments or questions, and I'm, I'm betting everyone does right now, please, please, I would encourage you to put them in the Q&A. Um, Rachel Logan said, I think we have to acknowledge that the foundations of medicine are colonialist, colonialist, sorry, imperialist and extractive. This is a continuation of that legacy. Community members have this knowledge because they live it. Um, really impactful. With, it, indeed, but with one small exception, the real foundation of scientific medicine was in Rudolf Virchow, um, who said, you know, physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor. Um, you know, Chow's approach was to use science um, to approach or to attack, essentially, um, the consequences on the health of communities caused by income inequality um, and, you know, sort of capitalist organization. So, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that hasn't, that, that was, that's where we come from. Um, and it's worth us focusing on that and continuing to work that uh, ideology. I think that's really, I think that's really important. Um, and then Caroline just added back to the conversation again and wrote, as a non-physician, I'm surprised that physicians who have so much power agree to work under such crazy conditions. What about if physicians striked for more realistic panel sizes and longer visits times? 15, minute pa pa per, 15 minutes per patient is not medicine. You know, I mean, the previous book called Healthcare Revolt tries to encourage people to start doing that. And I would, I would, I would just mention that my publisher for both these books is in Oakland, California, um, in your neighborhood. Well, thank you. And you're getting, I don't know if you can tell, but you're getting some clapping emojis going on here, the floating clapping hands here. Um, uh, so I appreciate Carolyn. I appreciate you adding that. I guess I have a question for you, which is um, in primary care, we think a lot and we talk about value-based primary care, which I, or value-based care in general, which I realize is not entirely the antidote to all of these much larger problems. But where do you think, how should I, as a primary care physician, be thinking about value-based primary care in the midst of all of these other larger functions? Well, actually, I keep saying value-based primary care. I mean, value-based care in the midst of these other discussions. Well, I'm going to say something that's politically unpopular. I think value-based care is another hustle. Um, it's another version of the things we've been seeing over the last 30 or 40 years, HMOs first, you know, accountable entities, all this kind of stuff are distractions. And, it, and, and they really attempt to, to ass they assume that physicians are motivated by greed ourselves, that you know, we're going to change what we do in some way because of how we get paid. Um, I think that's absurd. And and the challenge is not to, to sort of create different ways of gaming a, a payment system. The challenge is to build a delivery system, to build a healthcare system that is for people and not for profit and really does provide primary care to all Americans sort of taking what Jack Geiger started in the, in the early 60s um, and bringing it to every single American community and neighborhood and doing it so that people have panels of 500, not 1,500 or, or you know, 2,000 so that people aren't you know, sort of clicking boxes all day long and then going home and sitting in front of their computers between eight and midnight trying to empty their task boxes. That's absurd. And yet that's how, that's what we've been trapped into by these different distractions like, you know, value-based care and this one and that one. I think they're all hustles. I've been, you know, I've been doing this. I went through contracting through a, for a big physician IPA many years ago. Um, I've seen it come and I've seen it go. And I don't believe one, I don't believe any of it for one second. CMS is the problem, not the solution. You know, as far as I'm concerned, we ought to occupy CMS first. 
Thank you. Thanks. I want to, we have time for one more comment and it's from um, actually, okay, two more comments here. Um, uh, I want to add the comment from uh, Diana Coffa, who's our residency program director. And Diana writes, I agree that we have underutilized strikes as physicians. One of the problems is that we haven't agreed as a community on clear demands. There's essentially a soft strike already happening as people refuse to do primary care, but there are no associated demands. What organizations do you think are doing a good job of organizing and establishing clear objectives and demands? Nobody yet. I don't know of anybody who's doing it. I'm talking to some colleagues trying to light that fire, and I hope to be able to come back to you in four to six months and talk about an organizing process. Um, but, you know, I've seen a couple of attempts on the on the board of the Lown Institute, and that's the Right Care Alliance. They tried, didn't really go anyplace. You know, I don't think we've got that organization that, that works across all sectors of primary care, not just physicians, um, and works with patients and communities. But I think unless we build a social movement like the civil rights movement or the movement for marriage equality or the anti-war movement, unless we build a social movement, we're not going to change this. There's too much money trying to keep things the way it is, and it's going to take work. It's going to take time. It's going to take money of our own. You know, and it's not fair because we're already stretched. But on the other hand, we're, there just is nobody else to do this. We, we're the people who actually know it. We have the prize. We have this, this, this amazing thing called primary care that's so powerful. Um, and our challenge and opportunity um, is to understand that and then take the responsibility to share it. That is such a that is such a wonderful um, way of summing up this really important work. And I think, and again, I'm not sure if you're seeing all the thumbs up and hearts emojis that are fluttering out, but I think that I love seeing it. Thank but, you. But I think you've I think you've spoken very well to your audience here. At least at least well, I'll only speak for myself. Um, uh, and on that note, with the hopeful future of um, motivating all of us and seeing where we go with this and where you go with this, we, I would love to take you up on your offer to come back for, to us, come back to us in six months. Uh, tell us all the progress that we've made in, um, in organizing and addressing the forces that are trying to siphon off our resources for private gain. We would love to welcome you back for uh, Grand Rounds in 2024. And I cannot thank you enough, uh, Michael, for coming to speak with us today. So thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom. Oh, wait, actually, I think we may have time for one more question. Um, that was almost the end of it. But then I saw that Megan actually asked if she wanted to, if she could add a question. So I'm going to let Dr. Megan Mahoney come on and she'll give us the final question here as joining our panel. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> thank you, Margo. And thank you, Dr. Fine. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think it was very well received and relevant for our community. So thanks for taking the time today. I appreciated uh, the specific comments as a call to action, just this opportunity cost of shifting um, the money away perhaps from the executive pay from pharma and really thinking about what really drives uh, population health and health outcomes in the community along the lines of education, along the lines of housing and transportation, the other sectors that you mentioned. And as we start thinking about what to advocate for and thinking about that movement, I was hoping you could share some thoughts. Um, as you know, uh, the NASM report is recommending perhaps thinking about primary care being a common good in shifting into the public sector, but I, I, I just wanted to see if uh, you had any more thoughts about what is that first next step as far as advocacy for us. Oh, it's a great question. I mean, I, I've been saying that 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 primary care is is a public good for twenty five years. You know, I, I mean, I think we just need to think about it differently. But I think if we do only expand primary care workforce, we haven't done enough. We've got to work on a couple of feet, a couple of uh, walk on on two or more feet. Um, that is working on expanding uh, the primary care workforce, but also working locally in each community. You know, I think we all need to start talking to our patients in exam rooms. We need to start bringing our neighbors and friends um, into our living rooms and start talking about these numbers, and then pick something that's relevant for your community, work on public housing or work on, you know, I mean, I think public housing right now is a hugely big deal. You know, and my understanding is that in San Francisco, it's a even bigger deal than that. 
Um, but you know, public housing is a is you know, and and that's a local process at the end of the day because it usually has to do with NIMBYism and all sorts of other stuff. I I came out of the housing movement. That's what I did before medical school. So starting with housing, or starting with education, or starting with public transportation. You know, our voices. We are experts with attitude. You know, we have data, and we can get up in a public way. And let me tell you, I've done this. I've done it most of my life. You can go and testify before the state legislature. You can go and talk before the city council. You know, there are a zillion things you can do. Just start with something. In Little Situate, Rhode Island, the most Republican city uh, place in the, the, the very Democratic uh, state of Rhode Island. Um, but in Little Situate, Rhode Island, we are the only place in the United States where everyone is guaranteed primary medical and dental care. It's been like that for 20 years. We did that by a coalition of people working together. That's, you know, and and these things are replicable in many different ways, or you know, just pick one. You know, the the, the challenge is, you know, it's hard. Everybody's tired. And, and, you know, medicine has become such a battlefield. And it, it's, so it's hard to have the evidence when you go home. But at the same time, if we don't do it, we will. I want to thank you for that. And when you say, Michael, when you say just pick one, um, uh, Dr. Kevin Grumbach, who is our uh, former recent chair of family medicine, um, uh, shared with us uh, that patients for primary care is a formative effort to build patient health work, uh, sorry, patient health uh, social movements together. And he put the, um, uh, Kevin put the link into the Q&A, so hopefully everybody can see it um, and look it up and Again, we're, if we're all going to pick one effort, um, I'm hoping that together we can make a difference. I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity again. And thanks for the work all of you do every single day, listening to patients. That's what matters. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.